If we want to make fundamental changes in the way we govern ourselves, shouldn't we depend on reforming the existing state through voting, lobbying, and making demands through protest? Actually, no. And in this video, I'll explain why. In this episode, we'll talk about why elections and protests frequently aren't enough to create fundamental social change. In fact, I'll argue that limiting ourselves to these tried and true tactics of engaging with the state may be one of the key reasons why we haven't been able to really construct societies that are genuinely inclusive, equal, and sustainable. This may come as a bit of a shock to some. Many of us have been raised to believe that if there is something wrong with the world, we ought to ask the government to change it. If there is too much pollution, we petition the state to limit factory emissions. If some people are not granted full political rights, we ask the courts to remedy this. If people are in economic distress, we vote for people who say they'll shift policies. After all, this is a strategy with a long history and quite a few successes. In the context of the U.S., the whole Bill of Rights protected all sorts of civil liberties from abuse. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made some forms of discrimination illegal. The Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision shielded abortion rights for decades. And environmental laws passed in the 1970s have curbed some of the most rampant ecologically abusive practices of businesses and government agencies. I argue, however, that there are many reasons, which we do not discuss frequently enough, why these kinds of strategies are incapable of producing the kinds of political change we need to really solve today's problems. While many politically active people have been directing their energy toward election campaigns and reforming laws, there are many reasons why those strategies by themselves are unlikely to yield a more equal society. The problem is that many of the formal political institutions in countries, even those with different forms of democratic governments, are structured such that they are unlikely vehicles for creating a more just and inclusive society. So to illustrate this point, in the rest of this video, I present four major reasons we should be skeptical that elections or pursuing government reform will be enough to create the more inclusive and equitable society that we need. While I focus on US examples in this uh, particular video, uh, viewers familiar with other state systems will likely see some close parallels. My goal here is to use these examples to get us to think about the limitations of trying to convince the existing state to create meaningful change. Don't, however, despair that creating change through the state appears to be such an uphill battle. Later in this series, we'll dive into discussing alternative courses of action, like replacing the state, that have much greater promise. Okay, this may not exactly be a news flash, but the state serves the interests of the kinds of people who created it and who largely run it. And the state in the U.S. was constructed during the time period of intense European colonial expansion into North America, largely by male landowners who saw themselves as belonging to a race that was superior to others, and whose livelihoods and prosperity depended upon capturing the productivity of expropriated indigenous land and capturing the surplus value produced by either slave, indentured, or underpaid free laborers. The state was established not just to protect the founders themselves, but the economic systems and the ideological worldviews that sustained and enriched them. Initially, only male property owners could vote, and only people defined as white could even become U.S. citizens, even though the ability to participate politically was later expanded to others, the bones of the system were put into place to serve certain interests, and the structural ghosts of the past still haunt the machine of the state today. It has, for instance, zealously guarded the ability of the descendants of the original expropriators of indigenous land to keep that as property. It essentially affirms today that the correct distribution of property and legal jurisdictions are the ones that came into effect largely in the 1800s when the vast majority of people given legal title to land were Euro-American settlers. In a legal sense, time was frozen in the era right after 
indigenous people were thoroughly dispossessed of much of their land and resources, and during the time period when many other ethnic groups were effectively barred from participating in the dissemination of that appropriated land. Even if the racist logics and the people who espouse them are not as broadly present as they were in the late 1800s, the baseline of property established during that time is used by today's state as the foundational time period of rights that are still legally protected today. So the state has also enshrined the ideal that the organizer of production, right, the owner that we talked about so much in the last couple of episodes, the state has sort of enshrined the idea that they are the only person with the right to determine what they can do with the surplus value that they accrue from the underpayment of people who need to work for wages because they are propertyless. Voting rights may have developed and expanded over time, but the economic rights still enforced by the state only belong to a privileged few. So in short, many of the existing laws and state institutions are designed to cement and perpetuate inequalities, not remedy them. Or, as the comedian George Carlin once famously said about who runs the state in the United States, quote, it's a big club and you ain't in it. A second reason the state won't solve our problems is that it is full of people openly hostile to equality, inclusion, and sustainability. For anybody who watched how the Trump administration governed the U.S. from 2017 to 2020, or Boris Johnson's administration in the U.K., or how Putin and Xi Jinping rule their countries, this one is pretty obvious. Many nationalist movements around the world are openly dismissive of creating a more inclusive and equal society and environmental concerns are treated as largely unimportant, or in some cases, like climate change or the early days of COVID-19, they're treated as if the problems are overblown liberal fabrications. It is not just the leaders of these governing groups that are espousing these views, their allies in legislatures and other branches of government also parrot many of these same positions. Furthermore, even when these parties are voted out of power, Certain positions throughout the state bureaucracy are packed with, appointee, with appointees, some of them to lifetime positions that share these views. Because of the judges that are appointed, the employees selected for the divisions of the executive branch, and the bureaucrats that these heads have then hired, an authoritarian leader's fingerprints will last long beyond their term. And this is also true in the way that certain divisions of the government that enhance exclusion, such as immigration and customs enforcement, have been given these large budgets and leeway to operate, while other branches of the state that are tasked with things like environmental protection, diplomacy, and poverty alleviation uh, have been getting starved for funds, gutted of their professional expertise, and handcuffed by administrative prohibitions. That said, it would still seem that if the problem is that past governments have been hostile to inclusion, the solution should be trying to elect and support ones that aren't. After all, even if bureaucratic change is slow, it seems it would still be a good idea to keep trying to get better folks into those positions. There are, however, some problems to this logic, which leads me to my next point. This may not necessarily come as a surprise, but people with more money have greater influence in elections, and the wealthy hold more sway over officials after they are elected. People who benefit from unequal economic and political relations in the society have few incentives to support candidates and legislation that challenge them. A lot of people recognize this fact, but activists trying to push a country in a more inclusive direction sometimes fail to appreciate just how stacked against them the electoral and legislative arenas are. So in addition to distortions to the principle of one person, one vote, caused by things like the electoral college, legislative gerrymandering, the lack of legislative voting rights for people living in places like Puerto Rico, Guam, Washington, DC, and other spaces, most people also know that political campaigns cost money and the candidate with the most money usually wins. On average, the candidate that spends the most money wins a race for the U.S. House of Representatives over 90% of the time, and for Senate contests, it's over 80% of the time. This gives moneyed interests a huge opportunity to influence elections, but it doesn't stop there. After elections, the influence of the largest corporations and wealthiest individuals hardly goes away. 
through lobbyists and promises of donations for the always imminent next election, government officials tend to do the bidding of people who are already politically connected economic heavyweights. These people and companies have few incentives for tackling income inequality, environmental issues, or social inclusion. In fact, they may directly profit from opposing such an agenda. Security companies, military contractors, for-profit prison companies, investment banks, chemical manufacturers, fossil fuel extractors, healthcare insurance agencies, agribusiness conglomerates. You can count on all of these powerful entities to pit their potential for a profitable bottom line against your desires for inclusion, equality, and environmental protection every step of the way. For every petition you sign or letter you send, these companies likely have a paid lobbyist sitting down in person with a politician and promising them big checks. The effect of this is hard to deny. One study even showed that votes in the U.S. Congress have almost zero correlation to the, to, to the opinions held by the general public, but they are correlated to the positions of wealthy individuals and corporations. Statistically speaking, if your economic status falls in the lower 90% of the country's population, Congress literally does not care what you think. While governments have not adequately promoted the ethics of equality, inclusion, and environmental protection, those values are still immensely popular. When the state violates those ethics, people get mad, and they take action. Some people may focus on the uphill battles of influencing the state through elections, court challenges, and lobbying, but others have turned to protest as a primary tactic. Protesting is a strategy that still tries to make social change happen through the state, but crucially, it does so by using tactics that are not part of the official state apparatus. The goal of protest is frequently to demand that unresponsive officials do something differently. There are many forms of, that protest takes, of course, ranging from signing petitions to holding signs to strikes to blocking traffic to taking over and occupying important or symbolic spaces. What these approaches often share in common is that they are attempts to cause a disruption and draw attention to the fact that people are displeased with something a government or corporation or an individual is doing. And by any measure, protest is a key strategy in U.S. politics. Americans protest a lot. By some estimates, there are between 200 and 600 protests in the United States every month. In 2017, an estimated 6 to 9 million Americans attended at least one of the over 8,700 protests that occurred that year. Also, from time to time, protests explode in numbers, such as during the late 1960s and early 1970s all around the world, as well as in 2020 in the U.S. in the wake of the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The problem, however, is that while protests do have important political functions, many activists have begun to question the extent to which traditional street protests actually affect policy. This concern about the efficacy of protest comes back to problems with pursuing equality through the state. While people can think of protests as something that occurs outside of government institutions and procedures, it has a circular and dependent relationships with the state. Many people who protest are, after all, still assuming that it is the state's responsibility and right to do something about the issue that they're protesting about. Environmentalists may be pro uh, protesting for stricter government regulations on chemical pollutants, or for the government to set aside certain landscapes for preservation. Civil rights advocates may be asking that the state explicitly extend rights to people that that very same state has been denying them to. By demanding that the state fix the problem, however, it also validates that the state is the proper institution to turn to for help. So in this dynamic, however, what can you do when the state refuses to help? Protest again? Protest harder? Well, as noted in my earlier points, the state is largely beholden to and dependent on moneyed interests. What motivation does it then have for heeding the desires of working class people protesting in the street, even if they are raucous or frequent? Well, not much. That said, protests do have positive effects and that they warn the powers that be that their actions are out of step with the desires of the populace, and that business as usual will be disrupted until they change. 
Can you imagine if the state or some big corporation did something outrageous and nobody protested? Well, so clearly protests are often quite necessary to voice outrage and opposition, and they also help build the skills of activists and help build networks of solidarity among people who are struggling for positive social change. Protests can help us more clearly articulate our vision for what the world could be like, and they can help develop our communities for further political action. However, protests that make demands of the state are clearly not particularly effective at producing necessary social changes that go against the central pillars of that state. If a state was constructed for, and has long functioned as, an apparatus to build structures meant to protect colonial property relationships, as well as perpetuate economic processes that create inequality and overuse resources, well then protests, voting, lobbying, and petitioning that state to change the situation is likely to fall on deaf ears. Okay, so in conclusion, there are many problems with state power, and it is rightly seen as a huge obstacle to making positive social change. After all, the state blocks outright some attempts for change. It also sometimes creates processes that seem to be avenues to address grievances, but which frequently divert activism towards solutions that do not threaten the existing unequal property relations or the ability of the ownership class to amass fortunes at everyone else's expense. In addition, Perhaps the greatest trick state power has managed to pull off is that when people get increasingly frustrated and furious, it allows protests that seem to challenge its power, but which, in many ways, strengthen it when the protesters accept that it is the existing state power that ultimately gets to decide to meet a demand or not. So, what can we then do? Well, in the next video, we'll look at how societies function and why we can't simply do away with a decision-making apparatus like the state. In the videos after that, however, we'll get into the real nitty-gritty of why our best bet for creating better communities and a better world is not to try and reform the state or to smash the state, but to replace the state.